Okay, and we are going. Baby, push roll, please. Well, before we get started, I've got an idea I want to bounce off you folks. Let me know what you think. I just gave you out your charismatic perspective syllabus. Good material. But as you look over it, you'll see that there's a lot of it there that's just history, history of different sects and denominations and things like that. And it's good stuff. I'm not knocking it. But personally, I don't see a need to spend a whole lot of class time talking about that. So what I thought, if you guys don't mind not staying in that area a whole lot, we can condense this material down to three weeks, which means next week will be your test and your paper assignment, but you'll also get an extra week of Christmas break. So, any objections? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. I didn't think I had to twist your arms too much nah, on that. Not too much. I mean, I, I have to admit, when I was good, I was a little bit disappointed with that because I mean, it's got a lot of good stuff in it, but like I say, I've never been a member of any of the groups at all. Some I've never even heard of, and unless you have been, I mean, it's probably not going to have a lot of pertinence. I mean, it's part of our heritage, and it's good to stay for that reason. But you understand what I mean? I didn't. Going to be tested on any of. No, I will not test you on that. Praise the Lord. <laughs> okay, well, what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to uh, finish up the pneumatology part in the first section, and then we'll take our break and we'll get into the charismatic studies uh, section. And I'll confess a little fault. I left quickly and forgot my Bible, which if I'm going to teach it, I kind of need. So I borrowed from Pastor Keith. It's a different translation, so bear with me a little bit here. <laughs> I don't have the new living the Amplified and the New American Standard. Yeah. That's okay. We'll just... I'll, 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 I'll let you guys do most of the reading anyway, so... <laughs> I mean, I, well, I don't even have my dagger with me. My little... <laughs> oh, I had that. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Father, we thank you for bringing us here safely once again to assemble together and just feast on your word. And Lord, it's always a good time. And Lord, we just pray that Everything that happens on in every person's life will be 100% to your will, Lord. No more, no less. In Jesus' name, we bind the enemy. He will not in any way interfere with the, your plans for your people. And Lord, we just pray that our hearts would all be fertile soil. Lord, I'll learn as much from these discussions as anyone does. And Lord, I come here as a student as well as the teacher. And I just pray that this will be a time of sharing and learning among your family to equip us to better serve you in the world. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, this, i got to say, whoever wrote this uh, material is pretty straightforward. There's not a whole lot of fluff. fluff. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty much going straight into it. So I'm, I'm going to, I'm just going to flow with it. <laughs> this, we're starting with Lesson 7. The Sevenfold Manifestation of the Holy Spirit Upon. Everybody say Upon. Upon. In order to walk in all the blessings of God, we must receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit as did Jesus. And I like the way it ties it in because... Anything we study, anything we teach in the Lord, we have to be able to tie back to Jesus. Amen? Amen. The three scriptures here I'll go ahead and read to you. Matthew 3.16, Upon, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Luke 4.18, Upon, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. You notice he didn't say, I'm the Son of God, because I come to preach the gospel before. He was the Son of God. But he did that because of the anointing that was on him. And you notice this is something that I think gets overlooked a lot of times. The first group he was sent to in this, sent in this context was to the poor. Mm-hmm. I noticed that last night. Sure. Even if you look at, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Sermon on the Mount, Mm -hmm. blessed are the poor. poor. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's the modern church, I'm not talking about our church, but you know, the modern church in general has gotten so away from that. I mean, today our attitude is basically, let's get all the millionaires saved and see how big their tithes and offerings are, you know. (laughs) And I mean, rich people need Jesus too. Sure, we should reach out and minister to them, but this, Jesus' first priority was reaching out to the poor. And Sure. And the poor, you know, the poor recognize needs in their life. Maybe a wealthy person wouldn't. I was reading about a man who, um, he went, attended a um, pretty affluent, more traditional type church. And uh, he was used to them reading the scriptures in a very liturgical way, you know. And 
when the, the the Magnificat, the Prayer of Mary that we mm-hmm. tend to read around Christmas time, he was used to it being read in a way, just very formally. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent empty away. For some unexplained reason, that church he was going to just closed. He didn't know why. Well, looking for a new church, he found a different church. It was this church was primarily an African American congregation and was primarily poor compared to the other one. When when they read that same scripture, it had a completely different feel to it, you know, from the way he was used to hearing it. The people were crying out to God in a way that, like I say, a person who is more affluent wouldn't necessarily see their need to. You understand what I mean? Mm-hmm. But Jesus focused so much of his ministry to the poor, to the outcast, to people who were hurting. And that's something we always need to keep in mind. And Acts 1.8 is his commission for us to do the same thing. But you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be my witnesses unto me in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Samaria and into the uttermost parts of the earth. And I've never really seen it taught in this way before, but I like the way that... Um, that it dissects the different manifestations of the Holy Spirit upon a, on a believer. The spirit of wisdom, insight to accomplish the will of God completely to the minute detail without turning to the right or left. Someone want to read uh, John chapter 8, verse 29? I've got that okay. in uh, King James. And it says, And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone. For I do always those things that please Him. And that's how Jesus could be confident in the Father's presence in His life. Is He had that kind of relationship. He knew what pleased Him. He knew the Father's heart. And I always do what pleased Him. Think on in, old girl. He did them in faith. Exactly. Because without faith it's impossible to please Him. So exactly. He did everything in faith. And He was our prototype, for lack of a better term, on how to do that. Here you go. We're not going to start this until next session, but... Okay. Okay, anyone want to uh, anyone want to go with Matthew 16 verses 21 through 23? Okay, I'm going to be reading it from the Amplified. Okay. From that time forth, Jesus began clearly to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the high priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised from the dead. Then Peter took him aside to speak to him privately and began to reprove and charge him sharply, saying, God forbid, Lord, this must never happen to you. But Jesus turned away from Peter and said to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are in my way, an offense and a hindrance and a snare to me. For you are minding what partakes not of the nature and quality of God, but of men. So Jesus knew what he was going to be doing, even though obviously it was the most agonizing thing a person could ever face, it wasn't just uh, it wasn't a matter of looking for what am I trying to say it was understanding that that God was leading him in a way that was obviously going to be very painful to him Mm -hmm. but again he had his eye on the very end of it, he knew that as we talked about before he, even though he his he knew that he would rise from the dead and everything would be okay, he he did face the sorrows that went along with that. Mm-hmm. But he knew all along what was going to happen, and he still submitted himself to that. Mm-hmm. Matthew four uh, three through eleven. I'll read that one. Then the devil came to him and said, "If you are God's son, order these stones to turn into bread." But Jesus answered, "The Scripture says, human beings cannot live on bread alone, but need every word that God speaks." Then the devil took Jesus to Jerusalem, the holy city, and set him on the highest point of the temple and said to him, If you're God's son, throw yourself down, for the scripture says God will give orders to his angels about you. They will hold you up in their hands so that not even your feet will be hurt on the stones. Jesus answered, But the scripture also says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then the devil took Jesus to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their greatness. All this I will give you, the devil said, if you will kneel down and worship me. Then the devil answered, Go away, Satan. The scripture says, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left Jesus, and the angels came to help him. So Jesus knew about the the armor of God long before Paul would write about it later. I mean, he was using the word of God as his sword right here to cut right back at the devil. Amen? Amen? Next we have spirit of understanding, the knowledge of the scriptures. 
I understand what they're trying to say, but I really don't like making a dichotomy between spirit and letter because the letter shows us the spirit if you understand it right. But Luke 4.32 says they were astonished at Jesus' doctrine for his word was with power. Matthew 7.28 and 29. I've got it right here. When Jesus finished saying these things, the crowd was amazed at the way he taught. He wasn't like the teachers of the law. Instead, he taught with authority. John 7, 14 and 15. The festival was nearly half over when Jesus went to the temple and began teaching. The Jewish authorities were greatly surprised and said, How does this man know so much when he's never been to school? I don't like this translation. Jesus answered, What I teach is not my own teaching, but it comes from God who sent me. Whoever is willing to do what God wants will know whether what I teach comes from God or whether I speak by my own authority. And he was saying this to people who thought they had God all figured out. That's right. But he was, I mean, it wasn't that he, what he was teaching was new. I mean, it was things that the, had been building in the Old Testament all along. But it was someone who had, had become so hardened by tradition, this was really a major, a major thing. Okay. Spirit of counsel, ability, ability to share wisdom and knowledge at the right time and in the right way. And that's, that's very important. Someone want to read uh, Isaiah 50, verse, verse 4? This is the King James. Okay. The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season. To him that is weary, he wakeneth morning by morning. He wakeneth my ear to hear as the long, as the learned. I love that. I do too. And I really, if scripture. if that's not part a part of your regular faith confessions, it should be mm-hmm. because I mean we run into situations every day where we can give somebody a word of encouragement. Mm-hmm. You know, the uh, verses in John here. I'll go ahead and read those. When I think about that scripture, uh-huh. Mr. James. I think about um, as we even slumber and sleep that the Holy Spirit ministers to us and downloads um, uh, things to us, even things that we've read or, you know, maybe um, he he brings things back to our remembrance even as we slumber and sleep. And so when I listen, when I read that scripture, it's like, um, give me the tongue of the learned. Um, give me the right words to say as you've taught them to me even as I've slumbered and I've slept. Sure. And something I've experienced to base is there's times I'm struggling trying to figure out a problem I'm dealing with Mm -hmm. and there'll be times especially in my case this seems to happen early in the morning like when I'm in that time between sleeping and waking up just someone will come to me and Mm -hmm. thinking okay this is actually a pretty simple solution. Mm -hmm. You know, so I know exactly what you're saying. Sometimes when we get out of the way, it's really... Sure. <laughs> Which we, sometimes we try to figure it out too hard. <laughs> okay. This is... Uh, there, we're, talking, we're getting ready to read about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And this is an ex- event in the life of Jesus that you could probably get a good thousand sermons out of easy. Uh, if you've ever studied the history between the Jews and the Samaritans, the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other because going back to uh, the time of the captivity when there was interbreeding between the Jews and the nations that were holding them captive, it reminded the Jews of a very painful time in their history. Not that that justifies it, but I'm just saying that was the reason for the thinking. And Jews and Samaritans looked a lot alike. The way you could tell the difference were that um, they wore the tallits, the prayer shawls, and they, but they were different colors. One was blue, one was white. I don't remember which was which. But when he came to this woman, it shows one thing how Jesus reached, reached out across racial and gender barriers and we're going to see that's been one of them when we get into studying the charismatic perspectives that's been one of the strongest legacies of the Pentecostal and charismatic movement but Jesus reached out across those barriers he gave us if you want to learn how to evangelize look at how the master evangelist did it we're going to start here uh, with verses 7 John 4 a Samaritan woman came down to draw some water and Jesus said to her give me a drink of water his disciples had gone to town to buy food The woman answered, You're a Jew and I'm a Samaritan, so you ask me for a drink. Jews will not use the same cups and bowls that Samaritans use. 
Jesus answered, If you only knew what God gives you and who it is that is asking you for a drink, you would ask him and he would give you life-giving life giving water. I love that illustration. Mm-hmm. Sir, the woman said, You don't have a bucket and the well is deep. Well, where do you get this life-giving water? It was our ancestor Jacob who gave us this well and his children and his flocks all drank from it. You don't claim to be greater than Jacob, do you? Jesus said, Those who drink this water will get thirsty again. For those who drink the but those who drink the water I get I will give them will never be thirsty. The water I give them will become in them a spring which will just provide them with life giving water and give them eternal life. Sir, the woman said, Give me that water that I will never be thirsty again. Nor will I have to come here to draw water. Go get, go and call your husband. Jesus told her and come back. I don't have a husband. Mm-hmm. She answered. It stops here, but I'm going to read a little bit more here. I see your prophet, sir. The woman said. My Samaritan ancestors worship God on this mountain, but you Jews say that Jerusalem is the place where you should worship. Oh, wait a minute. I skipped over. I don't have a husband, she answered. Jesus replied, you are right when you say you don't have a husband. You have been married to five men, and the man you live with now is not really your husband. You have told me the truth. So before we talked about how, um, how the different gifts of the Spirit were functioning in Jesus' life, you see here a combination of gift of word of wisdom and word of knowledge. Mm-hmm. Let's keep it down to verse 28. Then the woman left her water jar, went back to the town, and said to the people there, Come and see the man who told me everything I've ever done. Could he be the Messiah? So they left the town and went to Jesus. So the gifts of the Spirit you see here are used in an evangelistic way, as a sign and wonder to point to who Jesus is. Verse 39, Many of the Samaritans in that town believed in Jesus because the woman had said, He told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they begged him to stay with him, and Jesus stayed there two days. Many more believed in him because of his message. And he told that woman, We believe now, not only because of what you said, but because we ourselves have heard him. And we know that he really is the Savior of the world. Like we talked about last week, uh, the, the connection between doctrine and experience. You, know, you don't build doctrine on experience. We know that. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that, we, that, we, that experience doesn't play a, an important role in how we relate to God. They, these people believed in Jesus because they experienced his power firsthand as a lot of other people in the New Testament did. Jesus told her about salvation first, not her sins. He reached out to her again in a way that would that would have been really looked down on in that day. But he showed, he showed her true kindness and compassion. And he used that power in in union with that love, with reaching out to her in love. He did mention her sins, but he did it in a way that helped her. He wasn't condescending about it. Because of the timing and the right way, many believed. Next we have the spirit of might, power, and ability perform miracles because of the Holy Spirit upon. So we want to read Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house? Oh, 12, 28. Yeah, so, if I cast that, the kingdom of God has come upon you. Okay. Okay. You see here the, the power of the Holy Spirit demonstrating in casting out demons, the power directly over Satan. Matthew twelve fifteen. So I'll, I'll go ahead and skip back to that. When Jesus heard about the plot against them, he went away from that space, and large crowds followed him, and he healed all the sick. So even though Jesus was going away himself for some time away, he still wouldn't turn his back on the people that are hurting. That's important to remember. Uh, let's see. So the spirit of knowledge of God, personal and intimate fellowship with the Father. Okay, we're going to divide this up um, because I want us to look at all these passages in unison uh, with each other. Tyrone, you want to read Luke uh, 5, 15 through 16? Mm-hmm. Cheryl, you want to do 6, 12 to base, uh, 9, 18, and... Marie, Mark 135. And I got convicted when I was reading this. (coughs) Okay. But so much the more went there a fame abroad of him. And great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. And he withdrew himself into the wilderness and prayed. Okay. Cheryl? 
It was at this time that he went off to the mount to pray and he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And then it occurred that as Jesus was praying privately, the disciples were with him and he asked them, who do men say that I am? Okay, Marie. And in the morning, long before daylight, he got up and went out to a deserted place and there he prayed. Jesus' prayer life has always intrigued me. And it's just, like I say, that's been a longing of my, I would love to have known. I mean, like I say, the scriptures tell us a little bit, but the communion Jesus had with the Father and mm-hmm. through the power of the Spirit in that way, I mean, that, I would just love to have been able to sit there and watch and drink that in. Mm-hmm. Spirit of the, fi- of the fear of the Lord. Mm-hmm. I'll, I'll go ahead and read these. They're all short. Proverbs 8.13, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, arrogancy, and the evil way, and the froward mouth do I hate. 1 John 3.8, He that committeth sin is of the devil, and commit means to habitually practice as a lifestyle. For the devil sins from the beginning. For this purpose was the Son of God manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. And back to John 8.29, which read earlier, And he that sent me is with me. The Father has not left me alone, for I do always the things that please him. So, all these things are tied in together in that whole idea of the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is one of the things, that, excuse me, Proverbs says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but at the same time, it's not the end of wisdom. In my, in my experience, I got saved because I was afraid I was going to go to hell. I didn't get saved because I really wanted a relationship with God, that, but that had to grow over time. And I still have a reverential fear of God, as we all should, but I've learned that there is more to it than that. And this whole respect, awe, reverence, obedience, and sensitivity. Are, those, again, those are good descriptions. They're all tied up in that. Okay, moving on to Lesson 8, How to Minister the Holy Spirit. And, you know, I worked for several years as, an, as a prayer counselor, and a number of you had, have had experience doing that. And, and I, I can testify it's important to be trained in this the right way. We talked last week about the baptism in the Holy Spirit and the importance of speaking in tongues. So you guys already have, I mean, even before that, I'm sure most of you had some had, had quite a bit of teaching on that. But learning how to actually share it with other people, whether it be in church or with your friends, it's important to understand that. So I'm glad they included this. Ministering the Holy Spirit is quite different than salvation. I don't like saying salvation is passive but versus being active. But you, I, I get the point they're trying to make. But... I always present the Holy Spirit as the easiest thing they have ever done and use examples. And this is a big one. The only criteria for a person to receive the Holy Spirit upon is that he must be born again. I've dealt with a lot of people who get into the I'm not worthies. And um, if, if anything is about our own worthiness, we're going to be dead out of the gate in the first place. And different people, you know, before I experienced it myself, you know, I thought people who spoke in tongues were the super spiritual ones. You know, people have said that about me, but no, not at all. I mean, I'm, I have my weaknesses like anyone else does, but that helps you overcome that. But, and if you're perfect, you wouldn't need it. Um, yes, it took me a while to find it. That's the reason why I, I wouldn't have. Uh, we were talking about the fear of the Lord. Uh-huh. And, then, and there's a verse in Proverbs 8.13 that says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, sure. pride and arrogancy, and the evil way, wow. and the forward mouth do I hate. Mm-hmm. I just wanted to, you know, kind of... What was that again, Mr. Tom? Proverbs 8.13. Okay. okay, thank you for sharing that. Mm-hmm. The Holy Spirit is a he. The Holy Spirit is not an it. Mm-hmm. If the Holy Spirit is not real to you, it won't be real to anyone else. He is a spirit and a real person. And I believe that's an aroma that we should give off if we've been with, if we've been in the presence of the Holy Spirit in that way. Someone will want to read John fourteen sixteen through seventeen then twenty six. intercessor, advocate, strengthener, and standby, that he may remain with you forever. The spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, welcome, take to its heart, because it does not see him 
for know and recognize him, but you know and recognize him, for he lives with you constantly and will be in you. But the Comforter, Counselor, Helper, Intercessor, Advocate, Strengthener, Standby, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, in my place, to represent me and to act on my behalf, he will teach you all things, and he will cause you to recall, will remind you of, bring to your remembrance everything I have told you. Amen. So in other words, Jesus was saying that the representation of the Godhead in the world was changing. Now, it's not that the Holy Spirit wasn't there before, but that was, but the Holy Spirit was about to assume the role of being the member of the Godhead that we will personally interact with on the earth. But by doing that, he will point us to Jesus. And that's the reason we have it so much better than the people who got to watch Jesus in person, minister in person do, because we can have that within us. Amen? <laughs> Next, Acts 2.38, he is a gift. It just taught, Like we talked about, it's not a matter of worthiness. It's about... It's a matter of giving someone a gift and they take it. Okay, I need that back though. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> you gave it to me. It's not a gift if you want to take it back. Hey. <laughs> Thanks. But, uh, you know, it's not something we have to earn a gift. Well, I guess he did have to earn that a little bit. But, yeah. <laughs> so maybe that wasn't the best illustration, but you get what I mean. I got you. We don't, have, we don't have to earn it. We don't have to be, quote, worthy enough because he's already given us that worthiness as a gift. The power, in Acts 1.8, in Greek, dunamis, dynamite. We, in other words, we can expect to explode on people. <laughs> okay. I, like that. I do too. Anyone want to uh, read Luke 11.13? the door a little bit. It is really hot in here. I feel like I'm going to explode on some money. Yeah, maybe so. <laughs> if, you, go ahead. if you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Exactly. You ask Him for bread, He's not going to give you a stone. Mm -hmm. People talk about don't seek that, that baptism of the Spirit, you're liable to get a demon. No, you're not. No one who is sincerely seeking God should ever have that fear, should ever have the least bit of fear about that. God, God loves us and he's more trustworthy than that. Let's see, where was I? Note the scripture says, Share your heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to him that ask him. Uh, all that a believer has to do to receive the Holy Spirit is ask for the Father in faith and receive the gift. Acts 2.4, you must do the speaking. The person must do the speaking. The Holy Ghost will not come on them throw them down and make them speak in tongues and again I, I've heard other people struggle with that too like they will what they sense inside them will be similar to someone else's prayer language they don't speak it I actually had a guy say well if this is really God won't he give me my own language but again whatever he speak, gives you just speak it out I mean you don't learn to speak English all at once you learn mama dada whatever you may get only get a syllable or two but as you use it you get more and I, I uh, also was talking to a man one time who said, said when he's ministering the Holy Spirit to people, he just tell, he'll start to pray in tongues and just tell them to mimic him. And he says, that at least gets him saying something. But I said, no, that's, you know, I was never comfortable doing it that way, you know. And I think also that it's given in different levels as God calls us from glory to glory. Because on personally, I've noticed that once I've gone through a transition, mm -hmm. my prayer language has changed. Sure. Mm -hmm. It's I've uh, I've noticed that too in my own life. I remember when I first started, um, I, I had a little phrase mm -hmm. like there was the day after, and I was off work the next day. I think God timed it that way, so I have time to let it soak in a little bit. But I'm like, okay, how do I do this? And I'm driving down the car, and I just had a few syllables at a time, and mm -hmm. I learned as I went along. Uh, mm -hmm. Now. I had a really unusual experience once. Uh, you remember Peter Cow, don't you, Cheryl, the uh, Vietnamese minister? Um, when I was hearing him one time, there was a time at the end of the service we all joined together was praying, and when I was praying, it was completely different than my, my normal prayer language. I don't know, but it sounded like an Asian type mm -hmm. language. And I had a vision in my, I admit my spirit, of a an Asian man wearing a white shirt with his eyes closed and a rainbow across his face. 
And mm -hmm. I passed it along. I don't know that it had anything to means me, but it may mean to to him. Mm -hmm. But uh, that was a time when, I, and I've never experienced anything like that since. So I don't I don't know exactly what it was, but. I know when we went to, uh, I guess when we had uh, <laughs> the United Worships at the Hispanic Church, mm -hmm. um, everybody in there was speaking, it all sounded like Spanish to me. I mean, it was, it was awesome. I never experienced that before. It, was, it sounded like all of us were had one tongue. Mm -hmm. It was beautiful. Well, we talked a little bit about Charles Parham's um, Bible School, where the some of the first uh, recorded experiences in modern days of people being baptized in the Spirit. Um, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but um, after the First Lady Agnes Osmond was Spirit-filled, Charles Parham had to go away and minister. Uh, I think it was in Kansas City, I don't remember for sure. But he knew this was going to be spreading by the time he got back and said he walked in the house, walked up the steps, and had an entire room of people singing Jesus, lover of my soul in tongues. Wow. Complete, in perfect harmony, like they had an invisible person conducting wow. them. And, yeah, it, it was pretty remarkable. <laughs> okay. Laying on of hands to receive, you can do that with, it helps to lay hands, but you don't necessarily have to. In fact, it's been said that a person who's seeking to baptize in the Holy Spirit, unless they have a trained counselor with them, it's probably better they, they do it by themselves. Because I remember Kenneth Hagin uh, relating an experience to where in a, in a like if you're doing it in church, there can be a large crowd of people gather around, and they'll all give them contradictory uh, advice. Like I remember, he said, like one person be saying, "Hold on, brother, hold on." Somebody else says, "Turn loose, brother, turn loose." You know, and it can get confusing to the person. In fact, Brother Hagen would counsel you that if if you say anything out loud, just pray in tongues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There, I went to a um, Pentecostal church for a time mm -hmm. when, when I was in my late teens. And I was ministering to um, middle school aged girls. And so I had one of the girls in my class that wanted to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You, you understand when I say Pentecostal church? Sure. I'm talking about been there for 50 years, okay? Uh -huh. So she comes to the altar at night, so everybody's tearing around the altar and crying, okay? But so we pray for her to be filled with the Holy Spirit. She goes flat on her back and she lays there and she just lays there. This little old lady, I swear she must have been 80 years old. I'm, I'm there, I'm praying in tongues over her, doing the, you know, I'm, I'm 18 years old, right. I know. But um, this little old lady came up to her, gnarled hands in the bun and yeah. everything. So she comes up and she grabbed that little girl's chin and she went, like that. I'm like, oh my God, like this is going to help. I'm going to shake yeah, really. you till you do it. It didn't work. Yeah, I, I've never forgotten that that is not the kind of laying on of sure. hands I think. <laughs> the, uh, you know, it's one of those things, people mean well, but it gets to be an emotional environment like that, and people get carried away. I got dazed one time. So What's that? Go. I got dazed one time, seriously, because it was at um, uh, Pastor James Davis's church. Uh -huh. He had the speaker from Hades or someone on the islands, and uh, I went up for prayer, and I... He stood in front of me, but it's like he couldn't, uh, the Lord didn't give him anything, so he just said, boom, my forehead. <laughs> yeah. I've, Did you fall? Yeah. He knocked, he knocked you down. I've, <laughs> I've had a number of people yeah, do so that with me. I don't me, do yeah. no more. I'm, well, I'm praying for myself. <laughs> I'm, I'm really careful. <laughs> I'm really careful when I pray for when I lay hands on someone. I, I do it very carefully. I mean, it's not an issue to me if, if they fall fine, if they don't. That's between no, them and God. Yeah, but I'm not, and I'm not going to give you any help. Doesn't even, that doesn't even so give a, a, a clear indication of whether they receive sure. or not. You know, I mean, they could. I mean, they can fall out just because they think that's what they're supposed to do, mm -hmm. and not really receive until they get home. Mm -hmm. you know, that's called to base. CD. <laughs> Courtesy girl. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that what it is? <laughs> yeah, my husband used to be the one behind it was all in his he, he, he says you can tell the ones that are just doing it just yeah. just to draw up just and they don't have evil hearts. They want to sure. receive. They really do. And, and, and so anyway, this so, all this I'm CD. sorry. No, go ahead. This was so funny when I was at um, my previous church 
um, I had been going to the intercessory prayer group and you know we were learning about you know prayer and you know how to lay hands on people and pray in the spirit and all that and so all that was really really new you know for me and so this girl came in and the lady that was over it she said um to face go over and pray for her it's funny now but it was funny then and i said oh okay so i walked over to her and i said you need prayer like that she said yes and anything particular and she told me like that and i said okay are you ready to receive and she said yeah i said lift your hands up and i didn't even touch her and all of a sudden she was like, blue yeah. and i thought you are <laughs> you didn't receive anything. I was like, yeah. <laughs> CD. Courtesy. Yeah, I was like, you know, I didn't receive anything. Do you remember Mike Warnke? The Christian comedian, his ministry got down, got brought down by a number of scandals. But uh, a story he told one time I thought was really funny was um, he was ministering at a big church in Texas and he got too close to the edge, fell off and banged his bottom on the altar rail. Well, he said the audience was half Baptist, half Pentecostal and they got in a fight on how to pray for him. Because <laughs> the Pentecostals wanted him healed on the spot and the Baptists wanted to have no strength to get through his time of tribulation. <laughs> <laughs> and he said they both got answered because he was here but he was hurting. <laughs> But he said a guy came up to him that was one of the real sticklers for uh, laying hands directly on the afflicted area. And he goes, when you've got a, bu got a bruised backside, that's not the kind of person you want. And the guy was like, in the name of Jesus. And Mike Warnke turns and says, buddy, if you do that again, I'm going to pray for your sinuses with my finger. <laughs> yeah, he, was, he was a funny man. I, I don't know, really know what he's up to these days. But uh, it was... a. Uh, Tail yeah, well, more than that, he was. He had a big testimony that he was supposedly a Satanist high priest and a drug dealer before he got saved, and it turned out that most of that was not true. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, you know, again, I think he's he found some churches willing to ordain him again, but I mean, I don't know how anyone can have a whole ministry built around a lie and then be restored mm -hmm. to any kind of credibility. Mm -hmm. But I mean, he was funny. I'll give him that. <laughs> but, Okay, anyway, uh, purpose for speaking in tongues. We talked about that last week. We don't really need to go back to that. But why people don't receive. And, you know, if you've had any experience sharing the baptism with people, you've seen all these things, I'm sure. Unbelief, people just don't believe. Pride, we don't want to be one of those holy rolling tongue talkers. If I'm saved, I already have the Holy Ghost. We talked about that a little bit last week. Lack of knowledge, I think that's probably the biggest one. Because if, you know, if someone comes from a denominational background that's never been taught this, it's a lot for them to take in. And a lot of times someone, uh, people aren't ready for it. Like I told you about my friend before who someone said, uh, do you speak in tongues? And he says, well, did that pass away with the apostles? She so said, you're not ready. Mm -hmm. and, but she came back and prayed for him again and he received right there. He was uh, filled with the Holy Spirit in the middle of the Adriatic Sea in the Navy. <laughs> it reminds me, um, I grew up in a little small country church uh -huh. and I had um, a cousin who was who is a pastor and you know he was invited to speak one time <laughs> and so they were you know Pentecostals you know Church of God in Christ right. and he began speaking in tongues you know a little backwater country church we never heard anything <laughs> like that we were terrified and so each time we heard that holy band is going to be like oh I ain't going there I'm not yeah. going to church today because you know he's you know we just didn't know mm -hmm. what all of that meant. Well, it was one of those things, you know, I told you about my friend I heard praying tongues over his lunch. That was the first time I ever heard anyone do it. And mm -hmm. what I experienced wasn't fear, it was just curiosity more than mm -hmm. anything. But I, I've heard a lot of people that really scares them when they first hear it because they don't understand yeah. it. And I, when I started going to a Pentecostal church, I mean, I, I went there a few times before I heard, and again, I, it didn't scare me. It was more bewildering than anything. But once I actually started getting some teaching on it, I mean, my experience, it was pretty easy for me to get spirit-filled. I, I didn't get it the first time I was prayed for, but I got prayed on a Sunday morning and I received it the next Wednesday night. Mm -hmm. And I was so caught up in it, I didn't think I could drive home. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, misunderstanding about the Holy Spirit within and the Holy Spirit of, upon. Again, we've dealt with that already. But the actual manifestation, have the person, people stand up and come forward, reinforce how easy it is to receive the Holy Spirit. And 
my personal opinion, and again, sometimes you just have to, you have to play the hand of dealt you. If you're ministering to a big crowd, sure, you have to do it this way, but I really don't think that's the ideal way to do it, just practically speaking. I mean, I personally prefer to share one-on-one -on -one with people, but again, if you're in church and you have many people come down, sure, you have to do what you have to do. And that's when you open the door up for not every situation sometimes to be a show because people are like, okay, I'm up here standing at the front of the church. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really crowded. Yeah. Sure. If I don't yeah. fall, mm -hmm. but if I do fall, you know, do I have on the right outfit? Sure. Somebody's going to catch me. Uh, am I really falling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. Did they push, push me down? down? Did they push me down? In fact, though, they recruited me to be an usher there one time, and I said, no, I had too much fun squishing you guys. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but you know, sometimes, again, people, if you're in a big group like that, sometimes people feel a sense of peer pressure. If they don't receive right away, they think they're being singled out. Mm -hmm. You know, again, again, I, I know I'm being redundant with this. There's times that's really the only way you can do it, but that's personally not the way I prefer to do it. Mm -hmm. You speak it out of your mouth, confess the word about the Holy Spirit, they repeat it, have them take a deep breath and speak out whatever is going around in their spirit. It may sound like baby talk or something totally foreign to them. Don't be concerned about the way it sounds, just get it out of your mouth. And that's true. This is important. Make sure they understand they're not to speak English. They can't speak two languages at the same time. You may, raise, you may lay hands on them to receive, but it's not absolutely necessary. If they don't receive, repeat the process. Explain, explain, explain. If they don't receive, give them the book Why Tongues, which is a very good book if you've never read it. Never tell someone that something might be wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Don't lay a guilt trip on anybody, especially somebody you don't know. Just explain that it sometimes takes time. Encourage them to continue and attend the believers' classes. I had a friend of mine that couldn't understand why she wasn't getting because she'd been praying for several times. Sure. And then she went, we were in a particular service one day and truth of the matter was that she was still holding on to the guilt mm -hmm. of her sin. Sure. Mm -hmm. And once she finally released that, mm -hmm. then the tongues came. Sure. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, again, it goes back to the whole I'm not worthy thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, next, the anointing to live. And that's a very important topic to all of us. And if you've never read Kenneth Hagin's book, Understanding the Anointing, I would really recommend you get that. Very good book. Christ literally translated means the anointed one and his anointed. So whenever you see the word Christ in the Bible, you can use the word anointed one as a synonym for that. And really, that, that really gives you some perspective when you look at some scriptures like, think of it this way, I can do all things through the anointed one that dwells in me, that strengthens me. To anoint means to rub on or smear on. Therefore, the anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit smeared on the believer for divine purpose. One divine purpose is to live a victorious life and another is to minister to others. What does the anointing do? Isaiah 10, 27. And it will come to pass in that day that the burden shall be taken away from thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. The anointing removes burdens and destroys yokes. The terms... This, was the, this scripture came in my spirit sure. this Sunday and it wouldn't If um, you guys know John Myers, who's been visiting our church recently, he did a really good song about this, uh, about how, uh, and of course, I can never sing any way like he can. I'm not even going to try it. But oh, if I sing, we'll have to change the name here from <laughs> Bible Training Center to Ichabod Training Center because the glory's going to part real quick. But uh, it's a song about uh, you've done great things for me and how the anointing breaks every old beautiful song. Mm -hmm. But um, and this is something I didn't know, but I really liked it. The Hebrew word translated destroy means to progressively corrode until something redu is reduced mm -hmm. to powder. The anointing does not just break yoke, it disintegrates them. Mm -hmm. So underline that if you haven't already. I hear say that um, Pastor Chris from Bible Training Center Ichabod, mm -hmm. that he was saying, he, oh, he yeah, did a confession, confession. CD. Uh -huh. <clears throat> And that was one of his confessions 
about the anointing that it would just destroy and just shred it to powder. (laughs) (laughs) The anointing is the most powerful force in the universe, that's for sure. There is nothing in this world or Satan's domain that can withstand the anointing. Anti-anointing. This, if you're in an interdenominational setting, you can have a lot of fun with this. <laughs> <laughs> when most of us hear the term Antichrist, we immediately think of the end time prophecy and the evil person that the book of Revelation calls the beast. While this term certainly does apply to the individual mentioned prophecy, the term Antichrist has a broader meaning. Antichrist, in First John two eighteen, is the verse that most people thinks an evil that versus those people thinks an evil spirits that are against the anointing. The name Antichrist literally means anti-anointed one and his anointing. I used to back in the days when I I don't use the internet near as much as I used to, but I used to be a chat room junkie, and uh, there was a Christian chat room. I used to, I was actually one of the administrators, and um, we were. I was like the first, well, first or second charismatic administrator. When they deliberately had, like they had some Messianic Jews, they had some Baptists and some people from different backgrounds. But one of the real troublemakers in the room was a guy in Arkansas that called himself Wretched Mark. And he was a, a, a pastor of a really old school Baptist church. He was very insulting with pretty much anybody that didn't think like his, and he especially didn't like people like us. And so I brought this up, and I talked about how the term um, Christ means anointed. To be to speak against God's anointing is to be anti-anointing or anti-Christ. And he didn't like that very much. <laughs> and uh, he was he started saying, "Don't listen to him. He's just talking about the kind of anointing the holy rollers believe in." <laughs> one time we got one time I banned him, and he called on God to smite me. <laughs> yeah, he was he was a character. <laughs> well, one time I was, I was, you know, so you ever think of people you haven't talked to in a long time, and you kind of Google them to see if you can find whatever happened to them. I, I knew his real name, and I typed in there, and it gave me this big long list of forums he'd been banned from. So, yeah, evidently so. I thought you were going to say it was a rap sheet. <laughs> you could call it that. <laughs> no, not that I know of, but uh, unforgiveness, bitterness, lying, gossiping, lust, and slothfulness, anything that goes against the anointing has an antichrist or anti anointing aspect of it. What's that? The attacks of the devil are all about stopping the anointing. If, if the devil can get you offended, that offended is a big one. Jealous or worried, he knows the level of anointing in you will diminish. Satan fears the anointing more than anything. That's why all of hell is focused on keeping us from doing the things that stir up the anointing. Prayer, time in the word, serving, and to get you to do the things that quench it. Strife, unforgiveness, fearfulness, etc. It is, very much so. Who's the man that, uh, that's, he's been here a couple of times, he taught on the power of offense. Um, you remember his name? Husky, David Husky. David Husky, yeah. If he, I, if he ever comes back, I mean, make it a point to be here. It's uh, really, he's got a really powerful message along those lines. Yeah, my pastor taught on the um, offense, the satanic trap. Yeah. Eight or nine CDs on it. Mm-hmm. It is. It's hard to listen to, but it's very, very liberating. Mm-hmm. An unction from the Holy One. The word unction comes from the Greek word that means to smear and oil with ointment. The unction enables you to know all things that you need to know in order to get the job done. In other words, it's an unction to function. Mm -hmm. The anointing is available to every believer. It's available to parents to help them know how to raise their children. (laughs) It's available to it's available to people in business to help them make wise decisions. Mm -hmm. It's available to to is there one? It's available to available. For every person's job description in the role of life, you have an unction or the anointing inside you that enables you to function supernaturally. And the good news is you can tap into it anytime you want. The anointing to function is the anointing to live. Let's look at 1 John 2, 25 through 27. All right, why don't you guys read it?
um, 25 through 27. Yes. And this is, I'm reading from the King James, and this is the promise that he has promised us, even eternal life. These things that I have written unto you concerning them that seduce you, but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man <laughs> he is able. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. I'm going to start at verse 27. Yeah, go ahead. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and you need not that any man teach you. But as the same anointing teaches you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, you shall abide in him, should be him. Is that it? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So notice the anointing is something that abides. It's not something you have to work up, even though obviously there are things you can do that will increase or decrease it, but the anointing is always within you. And that's an important practical truth to know. John 10.10, 10, but verse we all know about how Jesus came to give us abundant life. The Greek word for life in this verse is zoe, meaning the God kind of life. That's my, my, one of my daughters, as you know, his name for that. God wants you to live in me to live an abundant, victorious life. The kind of life comes only by abiding in the anointing. Have the record here of King Jehoshaphat, who was one of the godly kings of Judah, but he allied himself with the wicked king Ahaziah of Israel. Let's look at Isaiah 31:1. Uh, What's that? I'm lost. Can we skip the anointing and multiplication? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. My, I don't have page numbers on mine, and I had it. I was looking at the back. I'm very sorry. Okay, thank you for pointing that out to me. Okay. Well, hold your place, and I say if you're here. <laughs> okay, John chapter six, verses five through thirteen. And uh, Pastor Andy had a really good uh, teaching on this not too long ago. He is. What did he say in that song? That God didn't break on through to the other side? <laughs> I didn't hear that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I was a Doors fan growing up, so I can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, I told him when he gets his church in Asheville started, I hope they have a podcast because I want to I wanna listen to him. Yeah. I'll go ahead and read this one. Uh, let's see. Jesus looked around and saw that there was a large crowd coming to him. So he asked Philip, where can we buy enough food to feed all these people? He said this to test Philip. Actually, he already knew what he would do. Philip answered, for everyone to even have a little, it would take more than 200 silver coins to buy enough bread. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, who was Simon Peter's brother, said, there's a boy here who has five loaves of barley bread and two fish, but they will certainly not be enough for all these people. Make the people sit down, Jesus told him. There was a lot of grass here, so all the people sat down, and there were about 5,000 men. Jesus took the bread, gave thanks to God, and distributed it to the people who were sitting there. He did the same with the fish, and all had as much as they wanted. When they were all full, he said to his disciples, Gather the pieces left over, let us not waste a bit. That's a sermon there, too. I'm actually preaching that Christmas. Okay. <laughs> you recording it? Uh, you probably. Okay, we bring me a copy? Okay. I've never heard you preach. I'd love to hear that. Oh, God. <laughs> we'll all just show up. Hey? <laughs> it's on Christmas? I probably, no, no, no. Yeah, I probably will make it that day, but I would like to hear <laughs> it. Fine. <laughs> so they get. So they all gathered him and filled twelve baskets and pieces left over the five barley loaves the people have eaten. Seeing this miracle Jesus had performed, the people who there said, Surely this is the prophet who is to come into the world. Jesus knew again what was that they were about to come and seize him in order to make him king by force, so he went off again to the hills by himself. Focus on verse 11 that says, And Jesus took the loaves for the anointing of multiplication to be applied to your life. You must cause what you have to pass through the hands of Jesus. This is done through obedience and tithes and offerings. You know, another translation words it that when they, he brought the loaves and fish to Jesus, he blessed them. And that was the key component. That's what Pastor Andy was teaching on that day. And that real, I mean, I'd heard that before, but just it registered in me in a different way hearing him teach it. 
As long as you're clean to the little bit you have, withholding God's tithe and never allowing the Spirit to speak to you about giving offerings, the anointing of multiplication can't be applied to your resources. Most believers think that when they have a financial need that the problem is a lack of money. I like this. The problem is not a lack of money. It's a lack of the anointing. This is another good one. Let lack of insufficiency come when you allow the Antichrist to drive the anointing of God from your life. Perhaps you've let the fear of selfishness fear of selfishness cause you to withhold your tithe or cut back in your offerings, and before you know it, the anointing to prosper is dried up. Another example of scripture, one we're all familiar with, is the widow woman in Zarephath. Next time you sense the Spirit of God prompting you to give, don't get grieved, get excited. God is presenting you with an opportunity to get the anointing of multiplication working in your life. Okay. Now back to the uh, unholy alliances again. I'm sorry I missed that. I don't. I, I, I try to remember to put page numbers when I print something out, and I forgot this time. Isaiah 31. Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to my, those who carry out the plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit. Example of unholy alliances in Scripture. Moses warned against Israel going down into Egypt for horses. Solomon married a woman of pagan gods. This led to the downfall, led to his downfall and the downfall of Israel. You know, it already referred to King Jehoshaphat. The last sentence in Isaiah 31.1 tells us why these kinds of alliances are so dangerous. They represent a child of God looking to someone or something other than God for help, security, or provision. This is why unholy alliances are one of the greatest hindrances to the anointing. All of our help must come from the Lord. And Uncommon holy alliances, deceit, anger, stealing, corrupt communication, really any kind of sin would, would apply to that. We're constrained by a love of the anointing. The love of Christ, the, his anointed one, and his anointing constrains us. Constraining means to arrest or compel. Love. Escape something in. Oh, what a. Some common unholy alliance. Oh, I, I would just, yeah, I mentioned that. I was deceit, okay. anger, stealing, okay, corrupt my communication. Bad. I'm sorry. Oh, I was, I was still that's fine. on the other thing because it was so good. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I was just, yeah. I was just making the point. You know, this it would certainly include these, but that's not all inclusive. Uh, alliance with any kind of sin, you know, could would have the same effect. Love for the anointing will arrest you or compel you to stop when you're about to do something that will violate or quench the anointing. A love for the anointing will compel you not to forge unholy alliances with the enemies of that anointing. That's a powerful truth there. Wow. How do you cultivate a love for the anointing? By getting to know the anointed one, Jesus. Amen. The anointed one and his anointing are all tied up and tangled together. Philippians 3.10, I'll read that one. All I want is to know Christ and to experience the power of his resurrection, to share in his sufferings and become like him in, the, in his death. Right connections. Say, someone want to read Second Corinthians six fourteen through eighteen. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. Do not make mismated alliances with them, or come under a different yoke with them, inconsistent with your faith. For what partnership have right living and right standing with God with iniquity and lawlessness? Or how can light have fellowship with darkness? What harmony can there be between Christ and Belial, the devil? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? What agreement can there be between a temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Even as God said, I will dwell in and with and among them and will walk in and with and among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So come out from among unbelievers, and separate, sever yourselves from them, says the Lord, and touch not any unclean thing, that I may receive you kindly, and treat you with favor. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Now think about it. You've experienced that anointing that's destroyed the yokes off of your life. And if you enter into that kind of relationship, you're sticking your head right back, not only into a yoke, but you're, like think of, generally, you see a farmer using a plow with like two oxen. You're putting your head in that yoke with an animal that's going to be pulling you the opposite, opposite direction from what you need to go. Mm -hmm. Obviously, a lot of marriages have been destroyed because of that. Billy Graham said one time that if a Christian marries an unbeliever, he's going to get the devil for the father-in-law. <laughs> 
and but you know it's not just that if you do any kind of close relationship I mean and mm-hmm. and I realize there is a a um, fine line here because Jesus said that those that are sick are the ones that need the position we should be out there to minister to anybody we can but at the same time they're not our family that we have that kind of communion relationship with you understand what I mean mm-hmm. The words fellowship and communion are related words. The Greek translated fellowship is metoshe. It literally means intercourse. The word communion is the Greek word koinonia, which refers to a tight, affectionate, giving and taking kind of relationship. And the word communion is a a compound that means common union. The people and things we connect ourselves to through relationship, meditation, habit, or thought have a huge impact on our lives because they impact our level of anointing. Connect the word with those who believe like you believe. Finally, keep a right attitude. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Attitudes don't just appear full grown in a moment of time. Attitudes, good or bad, are fed, nurtured, and developed over time. Attitudes are contagious. The cure for contagious attitudes is setting your affections on things above. The root word for affections is affect. When you have affection for something, it changes you and affects you. We are told to let that which is above, the anointed one and his anointing, change us, rather than allowing the dead things of the earth to move us. When your thoughts, meditations, plans, hopes, and dreams center on the anointed one who is above and his anointing which is upon you, you will stay free of unholy alliances and you will not be infected by contagious attitudes. Powerful truths. Anybody have something they want to share before we finish this part? No? Okay, well it's... uh, 20 minutes till 8, let's take a 15 minute break and then we'll come back and start on the charismatic perspectives. Well, for anyone who may listen to this who wasn't here. <laughs> <laughs> I was still going. No, I turned it, I, I paused it when we went on break. We had a, we had a Holy Ghost meeting during the break. <laughs> so this may, this section of it may be a little bit different than planned, but I'm sure you'll understand. <laughs> So what specifically did we need to talk about the tongues a little bit more? What's that? Oh, you want to go ahead with the teaching? Okay. Okay, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I'm having a hard time following this. <laughs> okay. Um, our key text today is going to be from the 29th chapter of Acts. Yeah, there is. Where? Right here. Oh. <laughs> Amen. I was talking about the 8th chapter. I'm kind of surprised, I'm kind of surprised I caught you all with that one. Woo! But we're living in it. That's right. I mean, you may have noticed that at the end, end of Acts, there's no amen. Mm. It doesn't stop it. It's a continual thing. And we're, wow. we're living in it for today. Amen. And we're going to be talking about, you know, you remember when we first started last week, I said, uh, I want us, our focus for this teaching to be the unbroken line of activity of the Holy Spirit from the very beginning of the Bible on up to today. Mm-hmm. And it didn't stop when the Bible closed. Mm-hmm. I mean, the pan of scriptures closed. God's not given revelation on that level. Mm-hmm. And anybody who says that um, there are is a twit that we need to reject as such. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit is still very much in action today. And we're going to see some of the ways he was mm-hmm. through this. We started to really see an emphasis on this at the turn of the 20th century. On January 1st, 1901 in Topeka, Kansas, Agnes Osmond was baptized in the Holy Spirit and became the first recorded, anyway, Pentecostal of the 20th century. Charles Fox Parham, who we're going to be talking about a little bit more as we go along, and who is considered largely the father of the, quote, modern Pentecostal movement, when he prayed for on this, this is how he described it. I had scarcely repeated three dozen sentences when a glory fell upon her. A halo seemed to surround her head and face, and she began speaking in Chinese and was unable to speak English for three days. According to J. Roswell Flower, and when I was researching this, I kept seeing his name a lot. I need to maybe read a little bit more of his stuff. 
But this event would trigger the worldwide Pentecostal charismatic movement. By the beginning of the 21st century, there were more than 200 million denominational Pentecostals. If you include the mainline denominations and non-denominational churches like ours, the number now stands at more than 500 million people. A 2008 report by the Barna Group states that in America, a slight majority, 51% of all born-again Christians identify themselves as either Pentecostal or charismatic. That includes 46% of Protestants, and I thought this was interesting, 36% of Catholics. But the Pentecostal movement in America had its roots in the British perfectionism and charismatic movements, such as the Methodist Holiness Movement, the Catholic Apostolic Movement, and the British Catholic Higher Life Movement. But the greatest precursor to Pentecostalism was the the Holiness Movement. Talk about the Methodist Holiness Movement founded by John Wesley. And anyone who's never read about John Wesley, I strongly encourage you to. He was a man who was well acquainted with the moving of the Holy Spirit in his life. He was, uh, him and his brother Charles started a, a, an organization that came to be known as the Methodists because of their methodical way of seeking God. And uh, they were very strict in the way they hear, I mean they had a very, their discipline of their devotional lives was admirable, but John came to realize something was missing in his life. And again, many of you may have heard the story of when he was on Aldersgate Street in London and he was heard uh, Martin Luther's commentary to Romans being read and he talked about how uh, he felt his heart strangely warmed and he knew there and then that Jesus had forgiven his sins and taken his sins away. Mm-hmm. And when I was in the Methodist Church, we would have an annual uh, observance of Aldersgate uh, to commemorate that and they would do a, the choir would do a concert of Wesley Sims. I loved it. I would look forward to it all year. But um, he came in his preaching ministry, though uh, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, tongues, healing, the works were fairly common if you read his writings. And his understanding of the Holy Spirit's work in our lives is, is uh, immeasurable to the, way, to the way we understand the Holy Spirit. Wesleyan Pentecostals use the following terminology, a second blessing subsequent to salvation and entire sanctification. Now, entire sanctification you have to understand what it means. It doesn't necessarily mean you're sinless, but it does mean that being as consecrated as Jesus was is available to you in this life. John Fletcher was the first, as, as, as I understand, was a colleague of Wesley, was the first person in modern times to use the expression baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the um, Catholic Apostolic Movement, we'll be talking about that a little bit more as we go along, founded by Edward Irving. He taught on the restoration of the gifts of the Spirit. The British Keswick Higher Life Movement was a precursor to the Great Welsh Revival led by Evan Roberts. It, but this was led by American Holiness teachers and they changed the terminology of second blessing to an endowment of spiritual power for service. And the, the Keswick organization, you, you can't really necessarily call it a charismatic organization per se. There were people who went on to become leaders of the Pentecostal movement, but there were others who became opponents. So it's kind of split in that those different directions. But by 1901 in America there had been at least a century of movements emphasizing a second blessing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay, we're going to stop there and then go back in history further back and talk about the gifts of the Spirit in history. The Church of the New Testament retained its original gifts and Pentecostal power in the long period of struggle in the persecution before the triumph of Christianity under Constantine or Constantine's version of Christianity I wouldn't really call Christianity but we'll talk about that more as we go. After gaining acceptance by the church began to experience less and less of the Pentecostal power of the early church and turned more to ritualistic and sacramental expressions of faith. Okay, we're going to talk about a movement here called the Montanist, or Montanist, I'm not sure how you pronounce it exactly. But Montanist restored trunks of prophecy to his followers, but the movement was condemned by the church. Montanist was a man who was concerned about all the formality and institutionalism of the church. He felt that in order to be a minister of the gospel, you need to be gifted by the Spirit, not just set in an office by a human body. Montanus, but at the same time, there were excesses. Montanus claimed the prophetic utterances that experienced by his group were equal to scriptures. But the problem with assessing the Montanus movement um, is very few of their actual writings still exist. They've been destroyed over time. And a lot of the information you see about them comes from... Uh, books that were written to to condemn them. So you're only getting one side of the story. But a lot of the early church fathers did uh, testify that they were Orthodox Christians. 
Augustine's cessation theory, the charisma of the gifts of the Spirit, ended with the apostolic age. It's true Augustine taught that, but it's interesting that when he got older, he changed his mind on that when he started seeing a number of people in his church miraculously healed. But the influence of Augustine on the theologians that follow his cessation theory has had a direct effect until modern times. In the Roman Catholic Church, certain saints were said to speak in tongues and produce miracles of healing. Overall, the church taught that the miracles of the apostolic age ended in the early church, and there was greater emphasis on the administration and teaching as the church became more institutionalized. Now, again, as it said, if you read the Catholic saints, there are a lot of stories about miracles associated with them, but people who criticize the gifts for today would say that those were superstitions. Again, I, I, can't, I can't confirm or deny that. But I remember hearing Norval Hayes say one time, in his experience, Catholics were a lot easier to get filled with the Spirit than, say, Baptists, because they don't necessarily have the um, hang-ups about tongues that a lot of other churches would have. How did we, the, they get away from tongues? Uh, well, we're going to talk about this a little bit as we go along. Uh, part of it was, um, really, in Montana, the church's condemnation of them, and again, there were some excesses with a lot of the prophetic utterances that... And, and how they understood the gifts. There was an overreaction to that that was a part, played a part of it. And then I, the really the devastating um, um, effect, though, was Constantine's rise to power. We're going to talk about that shortly. But this is, it under, underline this in your syllabus, secessionist. We, you remember we talked about that last semester. Oh, the, oh, oh. Oh. Pen, under Pentecostal Roots, Lesson 1, it starts on page 7 uh, mine is different than yours chapter 2 yeah chapter 2 that's it okay. yeah. are you skipping everything up to there no I've already, this, I was talk, what I was talking about was I mean I, that's two. I mean skipping all of this Oh, yeah. Montana's. Oh, yeah. Montana's. 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 Yeah. We thought she was fine. I just want to make sure. Where's the Montana's? On page seven. Page seven. Page seven. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Three. Okay. Yeah. Eight. Okay. Eight. 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 Okay, sorry. This the idea of secessionism, the idea of the gifts of the Spirit have ceased either at the when the last of the original apostles died, when the Bible was completed, or whatever. This was a creation of the Western Church. It's been said, and I agree, that if you take a new Christian with no denominational biases, hand them their Bible, tell them go to a room and study all the miracles of the Bible, they're not going to come out as secessionist. You had to have to have this ingrained into you by other sources. And I have never read a secessionist person. Um, what does that mean? Someone who believes the gifts of the Spirit no longer happen. I've never known. I've never read a secessionist person who would make that case strictly on Scripture. They will use First Corinthians thirteen that talks about how mm-hmm. tongues will cease. We'll see, yeah. But again, it tells you when that will be. When that which is perfect has come. When Jesus has come. But it's like I say. Well, it, that's the case. Knowledge has ceased. Yeah, exactly. Well, we haven't stopped learning. If anything, I mean, people are more knowledgeable now than ever. Our access to sure. knowledge has increased. Exactly. Mm-hmm. But the main supporters were Augustine and Chrysostom, who perpetuated the secession of the charismata in the Western Church. I'm not as familiar with Chrysostom's view, but I do know that Augustine did change his mind in later life. Roman ritual speaking in tongues is defined as prima facie or on the face evidence of demon possession. But while the gifts did decline, they never went away. You see pockets of them at different times in church history. French Revolution during the war, the radical supposed a reign of terror. There reminded many of the... What's that? No, no, I'll just tell okay. them page eight. French Revolution during the war, the radicals imposed a reign of terror that reminded many of the scenes of the tribulation in Revelation and Daniel. Edward Irving, pastor of Presbyterian Church on London's Regent Square, went to Scotland to investigate reports of miraculous healings in tongues. 
He found Mary Campbell who spoke in tongues and James and George McDonald who spoke in tongues with interpretation. From this experience, Irving began to teach the renewal of the gifts of healing in tongues in his church. But after having Merrill Campbell speak in tongues in his church, he was excommunicated for, quote, allowing a woman to speak in church. <laughs> and for some heresy concerning some of the teachings of the personal Christ. And as I understand Irving, he did have some flaky ideas in those areas. He and his friends started what was called the Catholic Apostolic Church. They taught that all the charismata had been restored and that the apostolic office had been restored to the end times. Because Irving never experienced speaking in tongues, he was not accorded the rank of the apostle in the new church that he founded, but he was removed from leadership in his church and died in Scotland in disgrace. Charles Spurgeon uh, preached in 1857 a sermon titled The Power of the Holy Spirit. I did look that sermon up on the internet. I mean, it's a good sermon, but it's not really talking about the gifts, so I'm not sure that I would use that as in what we're talking about. He was. Well, he was a great man of God. I mean, he may not have had the revelation on this that we have, but I love me some Spurgeon. <laughs> Neo-Pentecostals, Charismatics, and Third Waivers. Pentecost, Pentecostalism. We're, we're, this is introductory here. I mean, we'll be getting more into this as we go. Pentecostalism spread into the mainline Protestant and Catholic churches. Dennis Bennett, rector of St. Mark's Episcopal, began the Neo-Pentecostal movement in Van Nuys, California. I'm on page six. Okay. I don't have page numbers on mine. We're back on page but, six. But again, this, these are, I'm, I'm giving you some introduction here. We'll be revisiting all these uh, in the body of the message. From the early days, Pentecostalism spread the fastest in Latin America, Chile, Brazil, Guatemala. Uh, they have in Guatemala and Chile, Pentecostals had an absolute majority of the population. Pentecostals produced many evangelists who was known for their mass healing crusades and sometimes very colorful personalities, such as Mary Maria Woodworth Eder, Amy Simple McPherson, Laura Roberts, Catherine Coleman, Reinhard Bonk, and Benny Hinn. And then, of course, we're all familiar with the new wave of faith teachers, Kenneth Hagin, Fred. Kenneth Copeland and Fred Price. Mary Rumsey baptized in the Holy Spirit at Azusa Street in 1907, planted eight Pentecostal churches in Korea, which were turned over to the assemblies. They opened a Bible school in Seoul, Korea, which produced Paul Yonggi Cho, pastor of the world's largest church. So that's, that's saying something. Okay. Okay. Now back to the origins of Pentecostalism. Is everybody with me? I'm yeah, the origins of Pentecostalism. Yeah. Um, let's see. Yeah. All right, Cheryl, you can come up. I'm looking. I see the Azusa. Oh, it's on page three. Yeah. yeah. Well, my papers are really out of. Yeah. Yeah, really. Oh, you, you got you. Yeah, I'm gonna have to put mine together when I get home. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. It's fine. I, we can we can read them as long as we. I printed these off at UT Library, and uh, they it, they don't put them all in succession. Like they'll print out like 12 pages or so at a time. And I was sitting there this morning trying to put them all together in paper clip. I thought I had them. I apologize That's if I got fine. them out of order. We don't write them. Okay. But we're on the origins of Pentecostalism. Everybody there? Mm -hmm. okay. Page three. Page three. Page three. Page three. Okay. Yeah. Or I'll be lost again. But we'll catch you up. Okay. The first Pentecostals can be traced back to Charles Fox Palmer's Bible School in Topeka, Kansas, in 1901. There, everyone, there with me there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Parham was an itinerant Methodist evangelist and his wife was a Quaker and one of his students was a man named Captain Tuttle and he saw a vision of a huge body of water getting ready to overflow. He was about to go preach in Kansas City but he told his students that while he was away he wanted them to study the Bible to find out an objective physical evidence of being baptized in the Holy Spirit. And in return he asked him what they found out. These are his own words. To my astonishment, they all had the same story, that while there were different things occurring when the Pentecostal blessing fell, they, that the indisputable proof on each occasion was that they spoke with other tongues. Mm -hmm. Paul formulated the doctrine that tongues were the Bible evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He also taught that tongues were the supernatural impartation of human languages for the purpose of world evangelism. Now, you know, I'm not saying that tongues couldn't happen that way, but through trial and error we came and learned there's more to it than that, and we'll talk about that as we go. 
Pentecostalism achieved worldwide attention through the Azusa Street Revival led by William J. Seymour. Now Seymour was a student of Parham's. He was a black man and due to the segregation laws he could not be legally admitted into the Bible school. But Charles Fox Parham worked that way. He allowed him to sit in a room next door and listen. So he was able to skirt the law in that way. It's one of the things if you I've, I was reading quite a bit about Parham the last few days and you see a lot of People have said that there is evidence at one time that Parham was associated with the Ku Klux Klan. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, I mean, his the way he conducted himself in with people of different races was way ahead of its time, like I say, by admitting Seymour into his school and by blessing his ministry. Now, there were racial tensions between the two of them that developed later, but it's, like I say, that doesn't, if, if, Part, I mean, he may have been affiliated with that at one time and then repented later. I don't know, but Parham's legacy in racial issues, as far as to the Pentecostal movement, was very positive overall. But uh, the Pentecostalism achieved worldwide attention through the Azusa Street Revival, led by William J. Seymour. It lasted three and a half years, having three services a day, seven days a week. Word was spread worldwide regarding the revival through the Apostolic Faith newspaper. But other press coverage wasn't quite as positive. This is um, a, um, I'm going to read you some excerpts from a story of, from, I think it's the Los Angeles Herald, um, called Weird Babble of Tongues. Breathing strange utterances and mouthing a creed which it would seem no sane mortal could understand. This newest religious sect has started in Los Angeles. Meetings are held in a tumble down shack on Azusa Street near St. Pedro Street and devotees of the weird doctrine practice the most fanatical rites, preach the wildest theories, and work themselves into a state of mad excitement in their peculiar zeal. Not as made hideous in the neighborhood by the howlings of the worshippers who spend hours swaying back and forth in a nerve-wracking attitude of prayer and supplication. They, have, they claim to have the gift of tongues and to be able to comprehend the babble. So... <laughs> But as we're talking about, the Azusa Street meetings were noted for their interracial harmony. Let's look at Acts 13. Verse 1, I'll go ahead and read that. This is King James. Now there were in the church of, that was in Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, the man who was called Niger, and Lucian of Cyrene, and Manan who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. This is New Living Translation. Among the, promise, the prophets and teachers at the, of the church of Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manan, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. So here we see that God's plan from the very beginning has been an interracial, multi-ethnic church. And so is it any surprise that when God started pouring out his spirit in this way in the 20th century, this was one of the first areas he started dealing with was kicking down the doors. And, uh, and like I played Barlman, who was a historian uh, that wrote a lot about the Azusa Street Revival, he, he described it as saying the color line was washed away by the blood. Mm. Mm. I think they always said that uh, there was, they had quoted scripture that said that the white race was the supreme race. Have you ever found that in the Bible? What they're probably basing it on is um, Genesis 9. It was right after the flood, and when. Um, Noah got drunk and passed out, and his sons uh, Shem and Japheth mm -hmm. covered him up. Where mm -hmm. Ham, uh, who is the father of the Ethiopian race, uh, the wording is a little bit ambiguous. Some have suggested that Ham may have tried something homosexual with Noah, mm -hmm. but he turned around and said, "Cursed be Canaan! You will be a slave to your brothers." But there's a couple of things to keep in mind with that. Ham was the father of uh, of the Ethiopians. That's true, but he had different sons, and um, Canaan. He didn't curse all of Ham's descendants. He cursed Canaan, who was only one of his sons. Mm -hmm. The Canaanite race was not black. They were Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And the Canaanite race has died out since then. Uh, but even in, even in Jesus' day, um, he, one of his disciples was Simon the Canaanite. Mm -hmm. But he, you know, the curse, like I say, was on Canaan individually, not on his uh, descendants anyway. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. Uh, I don't know the whole thing of that. But I... I used to know an elderly lady who I really enjoyed talking to, and uh, she talks about the Bible a lot. And just, but all of a sudden, I just noticed she started using a lot of racial epithets. Mm -hmm. And I confronted her about that, and she says, 
curse a ham. And that got through me because I didn't think anybody believed that anymore. <laughs> but that's that verse has been used to, that was what they just used to justify slavery and all kinds of horrible things. So you can use, I mean, you can misuse the Bible in ways if you want to, but the, you're seriously take it out of context if you do it. Wow. You know. Sure. Uh, actually, I, pre- I appreciate I appreciate you bringing that up. I mean, it's like I say, you have to totally butcher the text to do that. But people do it. Yeah. Let's see. But you know, again, that's not to say everything went perfectly. There were racial race tensions and other ego tensions too between Parv and Seymour. When the focus started going more on Seymour and less on Parm, that kind of got to Parm a little bit. And uh, but, but, you know, again, we're still dealing with flesh, and it, that does get in the way. But the Pentecostal pioneers, the first wave of Azusa pilgrims that journeyed through the United States, they spread the Pentecostal fire in holiness churches, missions, and camp meetings, notables. Gaston B. Cashwell spread the um, Pentecostal message in the South, and Charles H. Mason, you mentioned Church of God in Christ, spread the Pentecostal message in the Church of God in Christ. And I got something, let me find this. This was... Uh, this is his uh, Charles Mason's testimony of how he got filled with the Holy Spirit, which I thought was really powerful. The Spirit came upon the saints and upon me. Then I gave up for the Lord all to have His way within me. So there came a wave of glory into me, and all my being was filled with the glory of the Lord. So when He had gotten me straight off my feet, there came a light which enveloped my entire being above the brightness of the sun. When I went on my mouth to say glory, a flame touched my tongue which ran down me. My language changed and no word could I speak in my own tongue. Oh, I was filled with the glory of the Lord. My soul was then satisfied. He lived to be in his mid-90s. And I noticed there are some YouTube videos of him up. Mm-hmm. William Durham spread the Pentecostal message in Midwest and Canada. He formulated the finished work doctrine about the idea of sanctification as a second work of grace. That's taught some of the Church of God denominations. In fact, if you have Church of God friends, you may have heard them use the term save, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's a, that, even that is a controversial uh, issue within a lot of Pentecostal groups because, like, are you sanctified the minute you get saved, or is sanctification a second work of grace? To me, it's a needless debate because they're both true. When you receive Jesus, yes, you're set apart, so that, which is what the word sanctified means, from a evil purpose to a holy purpose. So that's true. You do get sanctified when you're saved, but there's also a progressive side of it, which you grow, through, and you, you won't fully receive that, achieve that until you get to heaven. But there's both, it's a multifaceted Jew, those both in, instantaneous and progressive facets of it. I mean, is there a second work of grace? Sure, there, and there's also a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth, and Jeremy, you need to get you there. Hmm. But this doctrine led to the formation of the Assemblies of God. And here's a few other names uh, that you may have, uh, be familiar with, affected by the indirectly by the Azusa Strait Revival. Thomas Barrett of Norway, Pentecostal Apostle of Northern and Western Europe. John G. Lake, African Pentecostalism, owes his origin to this man. If you've never read any of John G. Lake's sermons, it's powerful stuff. Mm-hmm. William Arthur, I'm not really familiar with him, but a British Methodist minister in 1855 published his influential volume, Tongues of Fire, and it remained in print for more than a century. In America, the language of Pentecost was beginning to change. The defining time was the Civil War. In the century prior to the Civil War, the terminology was influenced by John Wesley, and he used the second blessing in sanctification as meaning the same thing. But after the Civil War, there began to be a glowing tendency to speak of the second work of grace as the baptism with the Holy Ghost. In 1867, the first National Holiness Camp met in Vineland, New Jersey, calling for a return to holy living, but this call was couched in Pentecostal terms. Asa Mahan published a book called Spiritual, Scripture Doctrine of Christian Perfection, which is, was a defense of Wesleyan theology of entire sanctification, but it had little to no emphasis on the Holy Spirit, but he later revised it with a greater emphasis on Pentecostal language. The Pentecostal emphasis that developed in the holiness movement after 1867 also found expression in the various offshoots in, um, of the movement in England and America. The Keswick Higher Life Conferences began in 1875 as a British counterpart of the American holiness movement. Uh, let's see. And the Keswick organization still exists. I looked at their website and it says their, their goal is to encourage submission to the Lordship of Christ in personal and corporate living. To encourage a dependency upon the indwelling and fullness of the Holy Spirit for life and trans- transformation and effective living. 
to provoke, to provoke a strong commitment to the breadth of evangelism and mission of the British Isles and worldwide, and to stimulate the discipling and training of people of all ages in godliness, service, and sacrificial, sacrificial living, and to provide a practical demonstration of evangelical unity. Dwight L. Moody, after being baptized by the Holy Spirit at a prayer meeting in 1971, he began to conduct Howard Life conferences and thousands came to receive their personal Pentecost. Now, whether or not Moody spoke in tongues himself, it's been debated. Some people would say yes. I don't know if there are any first-hand accounts of that or not. But he did believe in subsequent workings of the Holy Spirit that way. Camp meeting holiness. Uh, uh, let's see. It describes uh, some of the camp meetings, uh, including things like falling into the power of the jerks, the holy laughs, and the holy dance. The jerks. The jerks. <laughs> I don't know if I've ever experienced that or not. Have you? I've seen. Have you? Let's see. I, I, as far as just reading these, I don't really see a need to do that. You guys can do that on your own. Mm -hmm. But uh, John Wesley emphasized the second blessing, which can comprise the, of the following parts: cleansing and empowering. Let's see. Then, okay. Let's go ahead and go on over to um, the Azusa Street Revival, Roman numeral two. Has everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, got you. <laughs> okay. Joseph, Joseph Smalley, a Baptist pastor in Los Angeles, California, heard about and attended the Welsh Revival of 1904 in Wales, which was led by Evan Roberts. He came back to Los Angeles and began a prayer meeting for revival which continued for 16 weeks Pastor Smalley allowed the Holy Ghost to lead the meetings which the elders didn't like after a period of time and you know there are people who get a little carried away with that whole idea I mean sure we should let the Holy Ghost have his way in everything we do but people who say the Holy Spirit was moving so strongly today the preacher didn't even get to preach and you know sometimes that happens but I've had to remind people the Holy Spirit is no less in charge when the preacher does preach it's just a matter of being in tune to what the Holy Spirit is moving at any particular time. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's interesting that um, Smalley himself never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. He's been called a Pentecostal Moses. Mm -hmm. He was able to stand and look into the promised land but wasn't able to go in himself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the movement that was largely created for laying the groundwork for the Pentecostal movement was the Welsh Revival. Uh, it was revival of laymen, the poor, and the outcast. It goes back to what we talked about, Jesus specifically targeting these groups. The leader was Evan Roberts, who was a first-term theology student, and there were many manifestations of the Holy Ghost, such as prolonged singing, lay preaching, testimonies, united prayer, and many were baptized of the Holy Ghost. Roberts' preaching had four primary themes that are vital to any true revival. That's confess all known sin, deal with and get rid of anything doubtful in your life, be ready to obey the Holy Spirit instantly and confess Christ publicly. Okay, now back to back to Charles Fox Parham again. He's generally recognized as the formulator of Pentecostal doctrine and the theological founder of the movement. He is also credited with the following: the first to advance the theological argument that tongues are always the initial evidence of a person's receiving the baptism in the Spirit. The first one to teach this spirit and this baptism, including the resulting tongues, should be seen as a part of every Christian's experience, something to be used in normal life and worship, and not just something that would appear during times of great religious fervor. The, I thought this was good. He coined all three modern names that have traditionally been applied to modern Pentecostalism, Pentecostal movement, Lateran movement, and Apostolic Faith movement, which was the original name for it. He founded the Pentecostal newspaper, The Apostolic Faith, and he issued ministerial credentials to William J. Seymour and many others who would become key people in the Zusa Street Revival. Okay. Okay, well, let's see. Okay. I'll go ahead and skip over to the part about William J. Seymour. Am I boring you guys with doing it this way? Okay. I, it, when we've got the scripture readings here, you know, we can kind of bounce that around, but we're just reading directly from the outline. This is differently what I'm used to, so if I'm starting to get off track, let me know. William Seymour, who was a new graduate of Palms Houston Bible School, accepted the invitation of Julia Hutchin to preach his first sermon on Acts 2-4. Seymour, at this point in his life, had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the evidence of tongues, and there was a doctrinal clash. Big surprise. <laughs> 
Patience was so upset on the teaching of tongues that she locked Seymour out of, out of the church when he returned for the evening meetings. Seymour took with him a small group of families which rejected the, Pastor Hutchins' ideas and he began teaching those that followed him in the home of Owen Irish Lee. The meeting soon outgrew his house so Seymour moved to 212 North Bonnie Bray Street. Soon there was a large contingent actively seeking the baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues. He was having trouble since he himself had not yet received it. Charles Parham sent Lucy Farrow, who was baptized in the Holy Ghost, and J.A. Warren, Warren, who was also to assist Seymour. And on April 9, 1906, he prayed for him to receive the Holy Ghost, and, and he received. This marked the first time Seymour got results from prayer to receive the Holy Ghost. And after testifying the results, Seymour himself began to speak in tongues, and the news quickly spread until they outgrew the home on Monty Bray Street. And he moved to a larger location, the Azusa Street Mission. And now this this building had originally been a stable and a warehouse. They just made very crude wooden benches and they fashioned to the pulpit out overturned crates. But it had its peak times from 1906 to 1909 and again from, from 1911 to 1912, running three services a day, seven days a week. People of all tribes, educated, uneducated, rich, poor, African Americans, Asians, Hispanics, whites, men, women, native born, recent immigrants, and foreign visitors prayed, sang, and came to the altar together. Boundaries between clergy and congregation were erased. Again, this was one of the things that squelched the gifts in the first place. Thousands of letters attested that many from around the world eventually received the baptism of the Holy Ghost after merely hearing of the Azusa Street outpouring and asking God to touch them where they were. There were no prearranged subjects or sermons. Everything was left to the spontaneous move of God. Amen. Amen. What's that? The people had dropped like 40 and 50 pounds. Oh, really? I hadn't heard that. In, in, in some of the sermons. Well, that makes sense. The initial phase of the revival fell off because of the rise of sectarianism, formality, and ritual. Again, more things that contributed, contributed to the decline of the gifts in the first place. The refusal of the majority of the Christian community to accept the revival was genuine. The human equality of the meetings offended many, especially the notion of racially mixed meetings. And some of the newspaper accounts of that were filled with racial epithets. Clara Lum and Florence Crawford removed the mailing list, which cut off the worldwide base of financial support. The hostile racial climate in this increasing racial tensions of the times. There was a total lack of newspaper coverage during the lull. The second P Pete came in February 1911. William Durham came to the Azusa Street meeting missions for a preaching mission. He came to the mission with a new theological teaching of the finished work. Mm. And many of the same manifestations of the Spirit that accompanied the first peak were present. When William Seymour heard about the teaching of the finished work, he locked Durham out of the Azusa Street mission. So we're seeing a lot of ego clashes involved here. Okay. Again, we're... This is uh, the next couple of pages deal with um, the uh, the spread of the message. Which praise God, I'm, I'm certainly not downplaying it. But most of these are people we're not familiar with, and there's again, I don't really see a need to read them all. But let's skip over to uh, point F. Overall, women constituted the majority of Pentecostal missionaries for decades, enjoying privileges that and responsibilities in ministry. Okay, you got that. Okay. So this has been a lot. This is is one of the things I really like about the whole Pentecostal charismatic movement is how progressive they've been both in racial and gender relations. And you talk about another thing that's going to get some uh, feathers ruffled if you, if you start talking about women preachers. I mean, they, <laughs> have, have you all ever experienced that? Been there, done that. Been there, done that. <laughs> well, you know, people, sometimes people I'm willing to be charitable are well-meaning because there are scriptures in the Bible that do seem to point that way. I'm going to look at them. 1 Corinthians 14, 13, I mean 34 and 35, which says, let the women keep silent in church. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's, but at the same time, if that's intended to say women can never <coughs> talk in church, that means you can't praise and worship God, you can't fellowship, you can't do much of anything. How would their husband know if the sermon was over if exactly. they couldn't wake them up? <laughs> Good point. Good point. What are we going to do about that? <laughs> But you know, the, the first First Corinthians eleven four and five does give uh, instructions about women praying and prophesying in church. So that that does show the women did speak in churches. But 
Verse 35 gives us a little clarification. If the, they mean the women will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. Apparently the problem dealing with there was women cause disruptions in the church by asking their husbands questions in a destructive way. Though you got to keep in mind that men and women sat in different parts of the room back then. They didn't have amplification. So the women, in order to talk to their husbands, would have to talk loudly. And you can see that would be disruptive. What did he mean by that? Yeah. <laughs> But you know, and that, that, that fits into, into harmony with the context of it, it which is talking about um, order in the church services, specifically talking about spiritual gifts like tongues and prophecy, but you understand what I mean. Uh, next, Second Tim, I mean, 1 Timothy 2.12 says, I do not suffer or permit a woman to teach or usurp authority over the man. But in interpreting that, you've got to remember that the words man and husband, woman and wife were the same Greek words. So it's, it's just saying that a woman is not to be manipulative or you spring over her husband. It's not saying that a woman can't share spiritual truth with a man. You see Priscilla and Aquila that expanded the way of God more perfectly to Ap Apollos. Mm -hmm. So was she sinning by sharing the word with him? I mean, when you see Priscilla and Aquila, you usually, you usually see her name mentioned first. So apparently she was the preacher of the two. Mm -hmm. The prophecy that we're really uh, Based on all this on, Joel 28 and 29, And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit of all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And all my servants and my handmaidens I will pour out of my spirit, and they will prophesy. Mm -hmm. Prophesy in the Greek can mean to proclaim, to declare, to sing, to write, and to preach. So, what's that? No, okay. we're just talking about prophecy. Well, really, that pretty much wraps it up on up to the parts of you know, discussing the denominational histories. Uh, I will wrap it up by, you don't have to turn here, but it finishes up that um, the first wave of American Pentecostalism, these holiness Pentecostal churches were the first wave in the world, starting with the basic Armenian Wesleyan theology. They added the Pentecostal baptism, evidenced by speaking in tongues, to their holiness theological system. The fivefold gospel of these churches became the first theological manifesto of world Pentecostalism. They were justification by faith, sanctification as a second definite perfecting work of grace, baptism in the Holy Spirit evidenced by speaking in tongues, divine healing of the atonement, and the premillennial second coming of Christ. Does anyone have anything they want to add to it? Well, you were going to tell me how the Pentecostal got start. What's that? I mean, you were going to explain why the break between them speaking in tongues and what happened, I didn't. Well, the, actually there was two big things that led up to that. Um, the church was starting to become more formal, inst institutionalized, and it was becoming more man-centered than it was Holy Spirit-centered. Like the Montanist I talked about earlier, there was when they started trying to bring the whole spiritual gifts back in, there was really a, an overreaction to that. And that was seen as seriously squelching the move into the spirit there. And then it came down around the third century when Emperor Constantine um, supposedly became a Christian. I mean, that's seriously debatable. But Constantine, now Constantine did some important things. I mean, he, he uh, had the, ed the edict that stopped all the persecution of Christians in the empire. And he, he convened the Council of Nicaea and that solidified a lot of important doctrinal questions. But he also started incorporating blurring the lines too much between the empire and the church. Really the church, first church buildings came into being in, under Constantine. Before that it was mainly, the, the church is mainly made in people's homes. The idea of the clergy dressing differently. And Constantine himself didn't do this but some of the later emperors started making Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. It was required that every Roman belong to the church problem was most of them were not born again. So you just had ranked pagans coming into the church. And basically that all that was one of, was one of the main things that that contributed to the gifts pretty much disappearing. Not completely but largely. Well they got for themselves pretty much well pretty much. But uh, it's, it was interesting there were a lot of the other Christians that fled that saw this as being a problem and they fled off into the desert and that's where they started a lot of the first monastic communities now that kind of went into the opposite extreme saying that um, you know Christians should live in poverty and things like that but their motives for doing that I believe were largely noble 
and you do start to see a resurgence of spiritual gifts in a lot of the monastic communities too. Anything else? Are you aware of the, the charismatic history in Knoxville? Mm, not a lot. I was there. Cool. Here. So, you know, I can, no, really? Yeah, I look, there was a church. It's a church in North, old North Knoxville called North Glenwood Baptist Church. I've heard of it. And the pastor there got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he began teaching it, and, and, and the church ended up turning into. The, the ones that didn't want it left, it became a charismatic. The, this is in the, the 70s. And um, that was my first experience with charismatic. Um, I went to church with my parents there, heard people speaking in tongues, and I saw a woman possessed by a demon manifesting her, which was, I'm mean, just a kid, I was just freaked out. But the, the church kind of got off track and got into shepherding yeah. where, where there was a lot of control and there were a group of men that, that broke off from there, began, I think they ministered in homes for a while, but then they began a church at Man's Mortuary in downtown Knoxville called Trinity Chapel. Oh, yeah. And that was Russ Priscilla, Huber Shear. Steve Uh No, Steve wasn't there. Oh. No. Um, and they, they met there in that, and it got to be where it was mainly Sunday night meetings. People would go to the regular search churches on Sunday morning, but then they'd show up for what Alan used to call is like the, the show, the circus almost. There was so much going on. I would, you know, I was standing up front one time, and the Holy Spirit hit this woman beside me who was thrown probably 10 feet, and I just, she's crumpled up on a door way over there, and I'm like, <gasps> You know, I, you know, anyway, um, but the church developed and it grew and they ended up buying a, a church on Dedrick Avenue. It used to be Dedrick Avenue Baptist Church, where I met my husband, where I got married. Mm -hmm. And, um, Isn't the same church that they gave the church to Pastor Dave? Yes, it is. Church of God. Yes, it is. It's the same yeah, church. It's the same church. Mm -hmm. That's what yeah. So anyway, that church split, interestingly, over women teaching. It did. And my father, who was a deacon, landed on the side of women shouldn't teach. And he went, and the others went, anyway. So it's, it's, and now it's, they wouldn't have a pastor for many, many years because of the, the problems that had come out of that shepherding movement and, and, and all that control and stuff. But... Um, they did get a pastor. He was a black man, probably in the 80s, sometime in the late 80s. I forgot his name. Kithcart was his name. Yep. And when he left, Steve Fato took over the church. But anyway, that was where, here in Knoxville, other than these old Pentecostal churches, that's where the new charismatic movement got started here in town. And we'll talk a little bit more about that next week. Wow. Yeah. Not that. Anyway, that was awesome. Well, I got, I mean, uh, my friend uh, that I told you about last week, uh, he went to the chapel. And, uh, you know, I was introduced to some people uh, to the charismatic movement by some people I knew in the Methodist Church, too. Um, Me, too. They, had, they were having what they call praise gatherings in the little chapel there. And uh, I, I was working at the church, and they invited me to come by, and, you know, everybody else had left. And I walked in, there was like three or four of them standing in front. They were waving their hands. I didn't know what was going on. I'd never seen this. But they just wanted this motion to come on in. And I was, you know, it was toward the end of it. I missed the first of it. And uh, they, but when they took prayer requests and they prayed for me, I knew I'd been prayed for. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember um, the Lighthouse Christian Bookstore in South Knoxville? I've heard of it. I've never been there. The, the couple that started that church came from Miami, Florida. They were filled with the Holy Spirit, started that, started having prayer meetings in the church. I mean, in the back of the store. And they went to my church, which was a traditional Methodist church. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and a number of the people in that congregation got filled with the Holy Spirit and ended up at Trinity Chapel. And Because at the time, in the late 70s, that's where, like I said, that's where it started. That's where everybody flowed to. I can remember asking my friend uh, Don, I did not get his real name, you know, again, I'd never been to a charismatic church, and I said, uh, do you guys sing hymns in your church? 
And he says, oh, no, we do it in a way that really lifts up the Lord. We put it on the, on the wall. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've never been to Trinity. I've heard a lot of good things about it, though. Uh, and like I say, I was at New Covenant for about six months. And I, you know, I really enjoyed my time there. Yeah, because Russ came out. He was the Sunday morning Bible teacher mm -hmm. there for years and years. I remember him saying him and Steve Bader were good friends. I mean, I never mm -hmm. met. I, mean, I, I never met Steve Bader in person, but I always, I, I always heard people speak well of him. Yeah, he he preached um, both my parents' funerals. Yeah, because yeah, because they they stayed there. Mm -hmm. After they both died, we had their funerals at the church. So the difference between Pentecost and Charismatic is what? Is there really a lot of this? To me, they're interchangeable. Okay. Because, now the thing about it is... Karen, Karen, I asked you a question and you didn't even answer. They're pretty much interchangeable. Well, to me, the word charismatic is a pretty general term. It's anybody pretty much that believes the gifts of the Spirit for today. It can mean anybody from the more low-key charismatics like Chuck Smith to someone like Rodney Howard Brown. Uh, Pentecostal tends to be more to go to the old line type Pentecostal churches. But again, other people would divide it by, would say, a Pentecostal beliefs that speaking in tongues is always the evidence of the Baptist Holy Spirit. A lot of charismatics don't. I wouldn't necessarily say that. Our church, I would call more charismatic than Pentecostal. We do believe that. But, you know, again, you'd have to ask Pastor Keith the yeah, semantics for that. I don't want to speak for him. But, uh, Pentecostal is the ones where the women are dressed up to here. Not always. And not always. Makeup, no but they were at one time. At one time, yeah. At one time. They have more of a tradition and a history. You, you relate the charismatic renewal to what happened, started happening in the 60s. Yeah, with Dennis Bennett. Yeah. It's, that's where, so there's the, the Pentecostals are more of the old time but th those churches then the charismatics kind of newer and now there's a new one that's come out of Third Toronto mm -hmm. that that's a, a different wave and there's probably more waves coming well, you know the, the whole Toronto thing uh, <laughs> I've never I've heard a lot of pros and cons I've personally never seen it to evaluate it they didn't have a meeting down at Rothschild's <laughs> catering out west and me and a friend of mine went I was riding with him. He had to leave before the actual prayer time got started. But one thing that struck me a little odd is the man speaking was talking about his wife got into this holy lap and started acting really giddy. And she started saying, Jesus is making martinis. And huh? I'm like, I don't think so. There's evidence of people barking like dogs and acting like chickens and doing... So they say it sounded like a barnyard. You know, though, I was watching a... Uh, it's in Toronto. Uh, it's not really new. It's been it's right that's in about the 90s. 90s. The 90s. You know, though, I was watching a panel discussion. So I saw you've heard me tell about this. Um, a man suggested that maybe part of that could be attributed to people who come in and the Holy Spirit comes on them, but they've not been taught about the gifts and how to respond. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. I'm hesitant to say a whole lot about it without having seen it. I do have a few of John Wimber's books, and uh, he was really... Uh, he was really a pioneer in a lot of ways. Uh, you know, again, this you know this started off with the vineyard movement, which you know was what he which he founded, and you know it does seem to have gotten off into some excess in some ways. But I've heard of a lot of people getting really powerfully touched by God there too. So, but there, but look at the Corinthians, folks. I mean, you can have genuine moves of God that in spite of the excesses. I mean, the Corinthians had people getting drunk on the communion wine and a guy having a affair with his stepmother. <laughs> But mm -hmm. when Paul wrote about and started talking about the gifts there, he never said the gifts they were experiencing were not real. Mm -hmm. He just said, use some word in the way you use them and get your house in order with the other stuff. That's where the sermon of the series called Christians Going Wild came from. <laughs> <laughs> okay. well, anybody else have anything you want to share? Father, I speak blessings over my family tonight. Lord, the Pharisees are precious people. And Lord, you are welcome to move here any way you see fit. And I thank you that you did see fit to come move in that powerful Amen. way here. Amen. And Lord, help us to always be open to you in church, certainly, but in our everyday lives, Lord. Lord, there are people who need what we got. And help us to be always equipped to have that ready for them. And we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.